Good morning, it's Alexor again. I'm over here, gentlemen. Uh, yeah, there's three people on the screen today <laughs> because I wanted to cover this. This was the last Q&A dev stream from 11th Hour Games, basically the last Epochs. Mike is CEO, I believe. And the lawmaster, the guy who is mostly responsible for the law. This was a great stream. You should definitely check it out. I'm going to link it in the description, of course. And uh, lots of interesting law information about the game. But there were also a bunch of things about the gameplay, which I, which is why I wanted to cover this in this video. So so let's see what they have to say. <clears throat> Sorry for non-lore question. Uh, so this one's going to be for Mike, probably. Do you have plans to take a big look at the Shaman and Forest Master passive trees? Look at the offensive and defensive power in newer trees. It makes me think that there is a lot of potential for Shaman slash for, for that Forge Master trees to get overhauled. Is yes, is this a cycle two possibility? Mike, what do you think? <laughs> Um, well, first off, you can feel free to correct the uh, the terms as you read them if it makes it easier for you. Um, okay, no worries. <laughs> uh, I just got to go off the cuff. And yeah, I just gotta go off the either, either way, it doesn't matter. But yeah, <laughs> I, 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 felt, I felt the stumble because it happens to me all the time. Forge Guard, yes. Um, it's Rune, Rune Master and Forge Guard. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, I, I think that we will... Hmm. I can't give any specifics on what's coming in Cycle 2. There are a... Uh, significant number of adjustments we've made to passives in general, um, and uh, Forge Garden Shaman have not been forgotten in there. Um, I don't want to s accidentally start some rumor of a, of a rework or something like that. Um, but but yeah, they, there's we, we know there's some love that is needed there, and uh, we are looking at passives. Um, there's a big passive update branch that hasn't been merged in yet, but uh, hopefully soon. <laughs> So, this sounds great, doesn't it? A big passive update branch. But he also said Shaman and Forge Guard haven't been forgotten because as you've noticed on my streams, for example, right, where I tried to make Shaman happen for 12 hours with three different builds and it just didn't do any damage. <laughs> just didn't really do anything. So Shaman definitely needs help. Uh, Forge Guard I haven't even tried, but people say it's a meme already because it's so bad. Um, yeah, so... But it's not just that, but also confirmed that a lot of passive updates will be coming with 1.1. Again, 1.1 will most likely be happening in about June, I think. They said three to four months from when it launched, and like per cycle, and the cycle launched in February. So around May, June, July, somewhere there, I guess June, uh, the next cycle will be happening, which is the 1.1 patch and cycle which will bring a lot of passive updates apparently but most importantly shaman and forge guard will finally climb up the ranks again to be able to play with the other kids hi probably a question is already answered on the session or some earlier earlier's q a do you plan some changes on set items my bad <laughs> tbh i would love change level nine coh to get it much quicker like level four and a fifth Mike, what you got? Yeah, so the uh, I, I can't really give any specific details on this right now. We we are um, not in one point one, unfortunately. Uh, we are looking at a pretty big um, shakeup to how set items work, and uh, you know, you know, like make them an interesting part of the end game gearing process. Um, we are also simultaneously for one point one looking at some adjustments to uh, the item factions reward structure, uh, the, like the rank rewards. So. Um, you know, like there's there's a bunch bunch of changes there, um, not just this specific one thing, but there are some changes. Great point. So there were actually two points. One, they're actually looking at item faction rewards, right? Because right now it takes pretty long to get to level ten to get your the most important buff. I think uh, maybe they're changing this. I don't know. But this was really the the sort of side thing. The key thing is set items. Now, they will be reworking them apparently a lot, especially endgame crafting process. So they will get something like legendary potential or something along those lines. Uh, so we can actually make them useful because right now, uh, the, the fact that uniques can be crafted to be legendaries is just usually much better than any fucking set item. And the set items take away so much space from your inventory that they have to be very good, which they aren't. So set items get a rework, not with 1.1, sadly, but for 1.1, they will change something about set items. Great, great change. Oh, this is... I'm halfway through reading it, and this is a follow-up. I'm really interested in the background, source, origin of Orbis. Is this something that has been explored in game that I may have missed? Or, without getting spoilery, is this something that we might be able to look forward to hearing more about in the future? Or is that the past? So, <laughs> another... This is another one where the answer is yes. So... 
there are currently planned three more, you know, campaign chapters of, you know, the main campaign, and the origin of Orbis does come into play within these last three chapters. I'm not going to say which one of the last three has it, but you do... It is a... The origin of Orbis is a question that is answered by the campaign once we have those last three chapters in. And just a note to edit, a lot of people, um, I think, shortcut the term, so it ends up being confused by some people sometimes, is that the, the boss you fight in the mono timelines is the Shade of Orbis, it's not Orbis yes. itself. Yeah, so the Shade of Orbis, that is a reflection of Orbis's anguish and despair and anger. It's not Orbis himself, it's more so just a kind of a, a twisted reflection of him that's being projected into these timelines from the time he was imprisoned and, you know, it's it's the shades are not Orbis. I whenever I see someone call the shades Orbis, I'm like, ah, oh, we should have named it on the side. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I gotta apologize. Uh, Mike is very low volume. I couldn't change that. It's just how it was on the stream. Um, he fucked it up himself. I can't do anything about that. Um, key thing though, yeah, Orbis. We learn a lot about this in the upcoming campaign, which we don't know if it will be in 1.1. I don't think they have confirmed if the new, the three new chapters will be in 1.1. I hope they are, because I know law is not really that important to many people. I like it a lot. I actually like the law of this, the whole time travel thing. And I want to know who Oribus actually is and why he's so mad. And Terra didn't learn much about her as well, right? You see them at the bottom. You can actually see it here. But at the bottom, if you look at your game, on the left with your health bar, down here where Mike is, there is a Terra, right? The lady. And on the right, there is Oribus. And Oribus is actually in chains. He's in a prison. So there is uh, some law about that. And also interesting side note with the Shade of Orbis, I didn't know that. I just thought it's Orbis himself we fight in the monolith. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I was like, okay, he's he's strong, but he's still beatable by a fucking human. Uh, but no, it's just his his reflection or projection into these timelines. Very interesting, very interesting side note there. I stopped playing because word seems mandatory after reaching the undefeated corruption if I want to progress. Will other options be viable for survivability? All right, Mike, what's your take on ward balance? Yeah, so we are, we, like, yes, ward, ward goes burr, uh, and it goes burr to, to burr, uh, and we're going to, we are adjusting the balance of ward relative to the other uh, defenses. 350 is a very successful build, though, so, like, um, don't sell yourself short where you are. And uh, But, yeah, yeah we, we are uh, very aware that ward is king right now. Key thing, I've said it before on stream, uh, Exangenous, right? The body armor that gives you a lot of ward, that eats most of your health and gives you ward instead. Pretty much mandatory in all builds. I play this armor in pretty much all my builds, even on a fucking paladin, right? <laughs> a healing hands paladin still plays a body armor that eats up all your health and gives you ward. That just doesn't make sense, not even lore-wise or in any stretch of the imagination. But it's just because ward is so strong, you even want to play it in your paladin. And they know it, they have said it before, um, they will be nerfing Ward. The nerf is coming, gentlemen. <laughs> um, yeah, so key thing, and I like it a lot because I want to use other body armors and not have to have play Ward, especially later corruption. But he also said a key thing, uh, 350 corruption is a good build. You shouldn't sell yourself short. And I think this is something I covered in another video where I said you don't really need ever to go to 300 corruption. I am aware that I think 200, was it 220, 260, something like that is the highest a prophecy will ever send you to corruption. And he said himself on stream, not on this one, I think, or maybe even on this stream, that there is no, no more content after 260 corruption, or even around 200 is where you get your Omnis uh, amulet, but that's the highest. After that, nothing ever new comes. You only get higher chances for item drops, for better item drops, and more difficulty. But it doesn't really make sense for most people to even go to that type of corruption, and especially to like 2,000, 3,000 corruption, in my eyes, is fucking stupid. I said it here, I'll say it before. <laughs> I said it before, I will say it again. Sorry, I can't even talk. I know people push this to get their clout on social media, and that's fine. You, you, do, you do you, man, and grind to this. But for most people, it's absolutely pointless to ever go to that corruption. Um... 300 is really enough and if you if you gain like if you get to 200 corruption even that's enough for your build after that you're done right your build is done 
You've proven it's good. It's working. No need to go any further. I don't want to dive too, too deep into this. I just want to, want to cover this because he also said it. At 300 corruption, your build is good. It's good enough. It did everything it needed to do. So there's no point in going any higher. And he said also on this stream, uh, you can check it out yourself on this very stream. And I don't know where it was. But he said he checked up all the builds that actually managed to get to 2000 corruption. And all of them, he said it, not my words, all of them actually used a bug or something that wasn't intended to work that way. Right? He said it himself. The dev said any build that goes to 2000 corruption was not intended to work that way. Key thing. You guys need to keep that in mind. 200 freedom corruption is around the highest you should be able to go to with most of your builds. If you can go really high on these 3000 corruption thingies, then there is something wrong with the build. Are you planning to implement a corruption catch-up system where the old characters don't have to grind through from zero? I'll let you take that one, Mike. Yes. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was. It was. The question was worded vaguely enough that I could say yes. Um, it, it's, it's. It's. You know, it's in the no specifics yet. We're still working on it. We're still flushing it out, all that sort of stuff. But yeah, it's. This is the. Like, alts, alts have an issue. This, I, I went to this, I did a whole like drawing thing on the screen last time, and oh my god, oh, it's not that bad. Um, the lots of times, alt characters, especially for very enfranchised players, um, you end up in long stretches of non difficult content, uh, like just, just, just rolling over everything to get to the hard stuff, to get to the fun stuff. Um, and so, we want to, uh, we, 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 we want to fix that. Key thing, uh, many have complained about this and me as well, because, for example, if you have your alt character and you get him to level 70 or whatever, um, by, for example, using my guide to get through the campaign the fastest and get all the bonuses, then you have to go through all the monoliths on non-empowered version, right, with zero corruption, and it's just a breeze and it's just boring. You want to get to the empowered monoliths the fastest because you also get better items, you get just better loot in general. And it's more fun because it's actually somewhat difficult, you know, it's just rolling over it. But you have to play through the entire monoliths, all 10 of them, to even get to the empowered monoliths. And that has been very annoying for many people, especially if your build is insane, right? If it's kicking ass very hard. I mean, I'm playing currently the Warlock, the Bleed Warlock, through the monoliths, and it's just super easy. I have no problems, not even with the bosses, and it's just a bit boring. So... I love that they addressing this. They or he said they're still um, in the process of working through it. So I don't think this will be coming for 1.1 because then he would have said, yeah, they will be coming. Probably not, which is sad. So we have to play through boring stuff a little longer, but at least they're working on it. So that that's great. Will there be an implementation on tweaking the loot filter to sort out uniques with different legendary potentials? For which a legendary potential in the loot filter. Any uh. Thing to add it on there, Mike. Um, y you know, I I think that that uh, community persistence can often bring about change sometimes. <laughs> but uh, no comment. Yeah, uh, community pressure can bring change, or however he phrased it, and see his smile. He basically confirmed it without saying it. Yes, there will be a loot filter coming for legendary potential, so you can actually. Set up your loot filter for, for example, you want to have this item with 2 LP on it and you don't care about ones with none LP on it. Great, great. It's a little bit of convenience. It's not that crazy because uniques didn't uh, like don't drop that often anyway, so you can check through it. But people like this a lot. Makes the loot filter even better than it already is. So I like that. We'll be able to have male or female for every class. Um, Michael, let you take that by the, the kind of short version of that I believe is still kind of the case of we'd love to, but gosh, that just literally doubles all of our animation and armor fitting, like you know, steps for everything to do with items and animations. But yeah. I'll let you get and, any more and insight voice on acting, there. Voice mm -hmm. acting too, and there's 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 a lot of stuff like the dialogue has to be touched. There's, there's so many things that, that it, it affects. Um, we do have long-term plans to include character customization to the game that would include body type as a setting. I want to cut in here because this is a topic. Some of you will hate that I bring it up. 
And I don't think Mike does it intentionally. It's just because he's been in the business for so long. The term body type is triggering me irrationally because I know that people pushing an agenda on games intentionally use this all the time. There is no body type. It's male or female, right? This is what it is. There are two genders, male and female, okay? There is no body type one or two bullshit. It was funny with Pal World when they brought it up because they thought that Western people like it that way. <laughs> this says a lot about the West, which has been influenced by this agenda. That's just male and female. Again, I don't think Mike is some woke shill. Uh, I don't think so. Even though there's something to say about the Take This charity he's using on this very stream, as you can tell above his head. Because they were calling out gamers and call it a harassment campaign when Gamergate 2 happened. I don't want to dive too deep into this topic because I know people are a bit weird about it. And I actually sent a ticket to support, forwarding it to Mike, that it is kind of dangerous to use Take This, the company, in your game because entire games have been cancelled by the gamers that were against the Gamergate thing. It's very dangerous. I think they don't care. Probably there are some, some contracts in it, so they have to use it. And it's a charity, I get it, but they put out a blog post literally calling out any gamer as racist and harassment and abusive who were fighting against people trying to push these agendas into their games. They just wanted to have good games and not have any politics in that. And the Take This, for example, called them out. Us, you and me, right? So, uh, yeah, you see entire gaming studios died before, like Rocksteady Games, for example, because gamers just didn't buy their games. I don't think this will happen to Last Epoch, all right? I just think you got to be careful with this, especially in the current landscape. And again, I don't think Mike is a Vogue shill at all. Uh, I think he mostly doesn't even want to be involved in that and doesn't care about it. But there is something you have to be careful with this because it's a big thing right now, especially on YouTube, and it's going kind of crazy. So let's hope Last Epoch doesn't get involved in that. But it is, of course, important for people to have male and female characters. Yes, male and female, not body type 1 and 2 in their games. I know this is a lot of overhead because if you look at it, if you put a different armor on your character, it also looks different in the game, right? So you would have to do all the items for example, the armors or the helmets and gloves and boots for male and female. You have to do it twice. You have to do all the voice acting, as he said, again, which there's also some money involved in that. So there is a lot of work to just get different genders or both genders, rather, for all these characters. So there's a lot of work involved to get both genders on all the characters. I know what people wanted. I would like to play a female mage, for example, some, some kind of... Yeah, fancy female Archmage, or even a male Acolyte, for example, or a male Rogue, right? Like a real Assassin, like Assassin's Creed kind of thing. That would be cool. I would like that. But I can see why this is not really a high priority. Although they said before, and I think he will say it again, I'm not going to keep the, game, uh, the video running here. He said they know it's a big wish from the community and they are working on it, but it will take a lot of time. He said in another stream before that it's gonna, probably going to take two or three cycles, the earliest, until they even get to that. So don't expect it too soon. They are working on it, but as, as I said, it's a lot of overhead. And again, um, I don't think Last Epoch or 11th Hour games are specifically Vogue in any sense. I don't think so. They just want to make a good game, and this is also why Last Epoch is so successful. But since he's been, he, he is a dev, and he's working with these companies like Tegas, for example, or any other... Um, consulting companies so there is some influence coming into that he's got to be careful um, because as soon as he probably or as soon as the game uses body type one and two over male and female youtube will go crazy about it especially because last epoch is so successful so be careful with that you should stick to the traditions otherwise uh, the game might get cancelled now us gamers we don't care we still want to play the game because we love it um but I mean, they, they need funding, right, for the game to survive. And we see it with Blizzard. Overwatch, right, is having this exact problem. The game is pretty much dead because they are going this direction instead of making the game good. So I'm just saying, you got to be careful with it. Anyway, that was it for this one. 
again, check out this entire stream. It was very interesting, very, very interesting stuff about the whole law. I didn't cover the law in this because uh, I think it was one of mostly cover the, the gameplay stuff, but great stuff in there. Also, he dropped a nuke at the end because he said it himself. There is, like the lawmaster here, there is a Easter egg in the end of time and nobody has found it yet. I guess there's, there's some sort of trigger in the game. The first person who finds it, they get a notification or something. Nobody has found the Easter egg yet. I ran around end of time yesterday like a fucking idiot. I could not find it. I don't know what it is, where it is. Maybe you find it. Definitely going to search for it. Someone got to find it. But yeah, um, great stuff. Check out the entire stream. And especially in the comments, what you think of me covering this? I know everyone does this. Aaron, for example, does it a lot. He, he has been doing this for years. Um, and other people cover this as well. I thought I want to give it to my audience as well with my thoughts on it. Maybe you think I don't give a fuck about these streams. Just give me more, give me more builds and more streams and more tutorials. It's fine. Just let me know in the comments what you think of it. If you want to have more of this and I will see you in the next video.